Hello and welcome to this short video on carbon dioxide transport. Carbon dioxide is one of the main end products of metabolism. The body contains approximately 120 litres of CO2. Here is a list of the normal CO2 values within the body. Inspired CO2 is typically 0.03 kilopascals. Expired CO2 is typically 4 kilopascals. Arterial CO2 is typically 5.3 kilopascals. Alveolus CO2 will be in the range of 4.8 to 5.3 kilopascals. And venous CO2 typically have a value of around 6 kilopascals. How is CO2 transported from the cells to the lungs? Under resting conditions, CO2 production in the body is approximately 200 mL per minute. The CO2 formed in the cells diffuses through the interstitial space into the venous circulation. And CO2 is transported in the blood in three forms. 5% is dissolved. CO2 is 20 times more soluble in blood than oxygen. 5% is transported as carbon amino compounds. And the majority, 90%, is transported as bicarbonate, mainly in the plasma. Below is the equation showing the conversion of CO2 into bicarbonate. Carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme facilitating this process at this stage in the equation here. We will discuss this more on the next slide. We will now look at the events that take place between the tissue cells and red blood cells. The reaction between carbon dioxide and water is slow in the plasma, but much faster within red blood cells due to the presence of carbonic anhydrase. Bicarbonate formed in the reaction diffuses out of the red blood cell, as we see in this step in the process here. However, the red blood cell membrane is relatively impermeable to hydrogen ions. Therefore, chloride ions diffuse into the red blood cell in order to maintain electrical neutrality, and this is known as the chloride shift. The Haldane effect describes how CO2 transport is affected by the state of haemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin is better than oxyhemoglobin for transporting CO2, and this is for two reasons. 1. Deoxyhemoglobin is better than oxyhemoglobin for combining with CO2 to form carbamino compounds. And secondly, deoxyhemoglobin is better at combining with hydrogen ions and this in turn assists the blood to load more CO2 from the tissues. As CO2 leaves the tissue cells and enters the red blood cell, it causes more oxygen to dissociate from haemoglobin, and we see that in this step here. As more oxygen is dissociated from haemoglobin due to the Bohr shift, this in turn means more CO2 is able to combine with deoxyhemoglobin and more bicarbonate is produced. We will now look at how the carbon dioxide dissociation curve compares with the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. The CO2 dissociation curve is influenced by the state of oxygenation of the haemoglobin. This is known as the Haldane effect. Oxyhemoglobin carries less CO2 than deoxyhemoglobin for the same PCO2. And we can see that demonstrated on this graph here. As we can see on the graph here, at a PCO2 of 6, when haemoglobin is 100% saturated with oxygen, the CO2 content will only be approximately 40 mL per 100 mL of blood. However, when haemoglobin is 0% saturated with oxygen, the CO2 content will be over 60 mL per 100 mL of blood.
as we see at this point on the graph here. The CO2 dissociation curve is more linear than the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which is sigmoid in shape. Thanks for watching this video.